The Bible says in in First Samuel. To me, it's talking. Here. The Bible says in First Samuel that the only two people that had swords were Jonathan and Saul. So this is actually something that I'm not going to give on a Wednesday night, but I just feel like I should say it now. So Jonathan's name means Yahweh has given. And Saul means ask for, ask for, to desire something. And then if you look, there were only two that had swords. So what does it mean? Jeez, this thing is talking to me. Eh? But what does it mean? It means that you need to ask for what God has already given. So that's what faith is. Faith is... Can, can someone also put the lights on, please? Faith is asking for what God has already given. So faith is not saying, okay, I'm going to do this and do that, and then God will listen to me. Faith is knowing and responding to what God has already done. Thank you, Desiree. And thanks for the worship, guys. That was awesome. Hallelujah. So, so when you have a situation in your life, you need to know that God has already given you the breakthrough. And you respond to it in faith. And one of the things we've been talking about on Wednesdays is the anointing oil. So you respond, you ask for, and you know God has given, and then you anoint yourself. And then you know that God has already given it to you. And then with the anointing oil, when you anoint yourself, you know that the Bible says each time when you anoint, you can, you can pray for the 100% instantaneous healing. The Matthew, I think it's Matthew 13, uh, Mark 13. But anyway, but it says that you get better and better each time. So, and you know that God has already given it to you. So is there anything anyone wants us to anoint for? Charlene, let's anoint you. Amen. Say, donkey is sure that you have already given. Amen. It's anoint for you on. Thank you, Yeshua, you've already given. Santi, use your foot there. Thank you, Yeshua. Yeah. It's anoint you on Jesus' name. So good. Yeshua. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Yeshua. Thank you, Yeshua. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Yeshua. Thank you, Yeshua. Thank you, Yeshua. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Uh, it's no off. Hello. Okay. So you need to know the Lord has already given it to you. If it's according to His will. But then, what is His will? That all your diseases are healed. His will is that you prosper in all things and be in health. 3 John verse 2. Well, there's no chapter, so 3 John 2. You know what God's will is. That all your sins are forgiven. The benefits of God. Healed of all diseases. Forgiven of all, sick, uh, of, um, of all sins. That you set free from oppression. That your youth is renewed like the eagles. God never wanted people to get old and die. You need to stand for like Caleb. Caleb at 85 years old went up and he killed the king of the giants. Amen. And we're going to take a look at the church gathering together as a church is the armies of Christ gathering together as well. And why do we gather together? To overcome. So when we gather together, there's a special anointing for overcoming, for happiness, for, for fortune, good fortune. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
Okay. So are we busy in the series over sermons, I don't know, sermon series you could say of beginning and end. Beginning and end series. And we're taking a look at Jesus being the beginning and end. Jesus said, I am the beginning and I'm the end. I'm the first and the last. And when Jesus says that, he's saying he's the I left of, the Alpha and the Omega. So Alpha is the first letter in the Greek alphabet. But in, in, in Hebrew, it's Aleph. And like you can see, the letter Aleph in the Aramaic, ancient Aramaic, was a sacrificial ox. And Tav is Omega in Greek. But in Hebrew, it's Tav. Okay? And that's the sign of the cross. It's actually a cross, but it means a sign. Hallelujah. So this is Jesus saying, I'm the Aleph and the Tav. I'm the sacrificial ox killed on the cross. I'm a sign for you. So when you see the Aleph Tav in the Old Testament, you know it's speaking of Jesus. Something specific regarding Jesus as well. And Aleph Tav is usually never translated in an English Bible. Because it's like AZ. How are you going to translate it? So when you find it in the Old Testament, it's saying something prophetic as well. Something significant. So today, so last week we talked about the last generation and how we are the last generation. Okay? If you don't know what I mean by that, you need to go watch my sermon. I'm not going to say everything again. But we are in the last generation because of Israel being reborn as a, as a, as a country, as a people group going back to their country. Amen. Jesus said, when you see, this, this, when you see Israel being reborn, you know that it is the last generation. Hallelujah. So today, I want to look at three concepts or three questions. I, I want, if you guys don't, don't know the answer to it, this will enlighten you. Okay. So why are we spared from tribulation? So what tribulation am I referring to? So there's different types of tribulation. There's persecution. So is the church redeemed from persecution? No. Then the Chinese and all these other countries know about persecution. Okay, even from when the church was started and Stephen was killed. So the church was never redeemed from persecution. Jesus said, if they persecuted me, they'll persecute you. So persecution is not tribulation that we've been redeemed from. And are we redeemed from the devil attacking us? No. The devil will always try to attack you. But what does the Bible say? No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Amen. And if you, if you st uh, stay humble and you receive the grace of God, then you are undevourable. Like 1 Peter 5 verse 7 says, When you cast your cares upon the Lord and you remain humble, receiving the grace of God, then the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So you can't devour anyone. If you remain humble, you receive the grace of God. You ask for wisdom. Amen. Hallelujah. So there's a difference between the tribulation or the persecution of man and the devil versus the tribulation of God. So God also um, puts tribulation on people. But the church has been redeemed from the tribulation of God or the wrath of God. So there's the wrath of man and the devil, but then there's the wrath of God. But the church is redeemed from the wrath of God. Amen. And then the second question we want to take a look at is, is that why does um, but of that day and that hour no one knows? So if you guys don't know, in Matthew 24, Jesus said that the, the, when the Son of Man comes, no one knows the day or the hour. And where is that, or who is that referring to? It's referring to the church. It's not referring to Israel. We're going to take a look at that. Okay, if, if there's time, because we'll always just stop if there's no, no time left. Okay, and then the last one, I want to teach you guys this concept, which many people don't understand, that there is a departing and a falling away at the same time. Okay, and there's a destruction and a salvation happening at the same time. Many people are linear. Actually, we saw a story just now of the Indians, and now the Indians think like circular they were describing but the western people think linear they think straight 
Okay, it was the story that we were watching. So the same way in Hebrew mindsets, they're Asian, or they Middle Eastern. So they have a more, like let's say, I've got this bottle here. And I'm like, what is this? A Jew would say, or in the ancient days, they would say, this is something you drink from. Okay? Uh, a Western mindset would say, this is a piece of glass. So is both is is it if one, is one wrong and the other one right? No, both are right. Okay, so there can be two perspectives and both can be right. Okay, but in the Western mind says it's either wrong or it's right. Okay, but both can be right. So the same way, many people will fight and say no, there's only a departing. Then others would say no, there's only a falling away. But both are right. You understand? So it's like when you look at a pencil. And someone will say, this is a piece of lead and a piece of wood. But then you can be like, no, this is something you write with. No, both are right. You see? So let's start off by looking at Romans 13 verse 11. And it says, and this considering the season. So it's important to consider the times and the seasons. And this is something we can know. We can know the times and seasons we are living in. The Bible says you need to know and understand the times and seasons you are living in. So that's why let's take a look at 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 1 to 3. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them, as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. So what's interesting here, is when the word for peace here in the Greek, is almost always translated in the Old Testament as shalom. So shalom's first definition is complete health. So just interestingly, we are living in a time where everyone is obsessed with health and safety. So the Bible says when the whole world starts saying health and safety, you need to have health and safety, wear this on your face, wash your hands, do this. When they start saying health and safety, then sudden destruction falls upon them, like labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. Interesting, eh? And then it says, let's go back to Romans 13, verse 11. So, and this, considering so the times and seasons, that it is now time that we should arise from sleep. So there's this thing coming through about not falling asleep. Okay? Not knowing that Jesus comes as a thief in the night. So not to fall asleep. You should arise from sleep. Then, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed it. So is Paul writing in his time? So Paul believed Jesus could come any moment in his day. So he said, now, now is our salvation nearer than when we believed it. Then he says, the night is past and the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast away the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of of light. So what is this armor of light? Okay? We'll take a look at that. Let's go back to 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 4. But you, brethren, so what did it say? They shall not escape the destruction. Okay? So like we said, there are those that fall away. So falling away will lead to destruction. A departing leads to salvation. So there are those that will not escape which will lead to destruction. Then there are those that will depart, leading to salvation. But what does Paul say? But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. So Jesus comes as a thief in the night, but He says this day does not have to overtake you as a thief in the night. You are all sons of light. So that's why you need to put on the armor of light. Okay? You guys still following? And sons of the day, we are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep, you have a sleep comes through, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch 
and be sober. So you need to be awake. You need to be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober. And now here the armor of light comes through. It's also known as the putting on the breastplate of faith and love. And as a helmet, the hope of salvation. So what is this armor? What is this breastplate of faith and love and the helmet of hope of salvation? What is this armor of light? Okay, we'll take a look at that. Verse 9. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what we've been saying in the beginning. That there's two different types of wrath. There's the wrath of the devil and men, and then there's the wrath of God. And what does the Bible say? God did not appoint you to wrath. Amen. And you can take a look at Romans 5, verse 8 and 9, where it says, Because uh, uh, start, God demonstrated His love toward us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. But then, most people stop there. It says, much more. Much more. Those who have been justified in the blood will be saved from wrath through Him. Amen. Much more. Those who have been justified by the blood, in the blood. And what does justified mean? Being declared righteous. Okay. I need to stand still. Seems like it tonight. Verse 10. For, okay, so, for God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us. And whether we wake or sleep, but now it's talking about whether you are alive or dead. Okay? Because sleep also has to do with being dead. So you need to understand where Paul is coming from. Here he's talking whether you are awake or sleep. But even, yes, where if you know your Bible, you know if you've been born again, and like the... The, the, the situation Jesus gave at, in Matthew 20, 25, when He talks about the, the virgins that fell asleep. All of them fell asleep. Okay? Even those who went in, they also fell asleep. So, when, even if you fall asleep, you need to have that oil with you. Amen. And what is the oil? The oil of gladness is knowing I'm the righteousness of God in Christ and... Jesus took all my offenses. Amen. Verse 11. Oh, we should, then we should live together with Him. Amen. Jesus lives together with us. Amen. He's here with you. Actually, if you look at this one word, which I'll be studying and also sharing in a Wednesday thing, Atta. Atta is the word. And it's Aleftav, with grace, with A. And Atta is used to say, it's usually used to say that that the person is with you. But here, Atta is used in the New Testament as Maranatha, as come Lord Jesus. So when you say the shepherd is with you, you're also saying the shepherd is coming for you. Amen. But then, but then this, this word, the first time it appears, is where the angel of the Lord appeared to Hagar. And the angel said, Hagar said, the angel of the Lord saw me. So it's also to see you. So when it says here that we should live together with Him, you should know that the Lord sees you, He is with you, and He's coming for you. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Therefore, comfort each other. Comfort each other with this. Amen. And edify one another, just as you also are doing. Hallelujah. So we're seeing a picture here of you should stay awake, you shouldn't fall asleep. Amen. And then this being clothed with the armor of light, the armor of the breastplate of faith and love. And like we know in Ephesians 6, it's the breastplate of righteousness. And then the helmet of the hope of salvation. And then it continues. Let's go to Romans 13 verse 13. So it says, So that we walk honestly. Because what did he say in verse 12? Wear the armor of light. Wake up. Be sober. Wear the armor of light. Don't cast away the works of darkness. Then verse 13. So that we walk honestly. 
not as hypocrites. Because what's a hypocrite? Is doing something that you're not supposed to do. So if you're a princess and you've got a white gown on, and when you play in the mud, then you're a hypocrite. Because pigs are supposed to play in the mud. Amen. If you're a kind, nice person, and then you're being unkind, then you're being a hypocrite. Amen. But if you're a sinner, if you're an al alcoholic, and you be acting sober, then you're also a hypocrite. You should be drunk. You know? So, the Bible says that we have a righteousness of God in Christ. So when you act like a sinner, then you're being a hypocrite. But if you're a sinner acting like you're righteous, then you're also being a hypocrite. Because it's only Jesus' righteousness that make you righteous. So, so that we walk honestly, not hypocrites, as in the day. So we walk in the day. Amen. Not in gluttony, revelry, carousing, partying, and drunkenness. Neither in chambering, sexual promiscuity, lewdness, and wantonness, irresponsibility, lust. Nor in strife, quarreling, and envying, jealousy. But, but, the other side of your but is always important. But, put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and take no thought for the flesh to fulfill the lust of it. So how do you put on Jesus Christ? What did Paul say? Put on the armor of light. Put on the breastplate of faith and love. How do you put it on? What is it? It's righteousness. And what is righteousness? It's a gift. Amen? And that's why 1 Corinthians 15 verse 34 says, Awake to righteousness and sin not. So how are you going to avoid all these... How are you going to avoid being a hypocrite? By awaking to righteousness. So we want to awake. We don't want to fall asleep. We don't want to be in darkness. We want to be in the light. Because we are in the light. If you're in the dark, then you're a hypocrite. You're actually in the light. Because it's like a person standing in the daytime with his eyes closed, sleeping. It's like it's nighttime. No, you're actually in the day. Open your eyes. Awake to righteousness. Know that you are the righteousness of God in Christ. And what does it mean to be the righteousness of God in Christ? It means to be always right with Father God. Because of what Jesus has done on the cross. And what did Romans 5 verse 9 say? You are justified in the blood. So you're not righteous because of anything you've done. You're righteous, justified, just as if you've never sinned, by the blood of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. You guys following? So we know we are the righteousness of God in Christ. Amen. So let's go back to our series, Genesis 29. Okay? So in Genesis 29, we saw in verse 22 that Laban, and who was Laban? Laban's name means white. And white refers to being justified, cleansed. So he's someone that's been declared righteous. So what's going to happen? Those who have been declared righteous will be gathered together by Yeshua. And who's Yeshua? Yeah, but our left off. But our left off will gather together those who have been declared righteous. All the men of the place. So Jesus gathers everyone together and He makes a feast. Amen. Hallelujah. So that's what we're also trying to do when, when, when you have Sunday ev uh, um, morning and evening service to gather together. And that's what we're trying to do now with the Wednesday service also. So the Wednesday service, our prerogative or whatever, is going to be Acts 2, verse 42, which says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, that word there is koinonia, in the breaking of bread. And what do we know the breaking of bread is? It's a love feast. Amen. It's the communion. Communion means love feast. And in prayers. So what is it saying there in, in verse 22? Genesis 29 verse 22. It's saying Jesus gathers you together. All the men. And men refers to the women as well. Amen. Don't get offended because men aren't offended when we say we're the bride of Christ. Eh? Okay. So gathering together. The righteous gather together to feast. Amen. So that's what we do. We continue steadfastly gathering together to in koinonia. 
to feast the communion, to feast on the communion and in prayers, declarations. Amen. And verse 46 says, So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread, so the love feast, from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So also when you come to church, what, what, um, we, I don't know if we have time to get to it, but it's gathering together to have fortune. Amen. Good fortune. So you need to expect that you, have, you are highly favored. You are highly favored. When you go around at your job with other people, that you are highly favored everywhere you go. Amen. Hallelujah. Good fortune. And having favor with all the people. So even if they don't like you, because not everyone's going to like you, but you need to expect to have favor with everyone. Amen. Because favor is unmerited. Amen. It's actually unmerited, unearned, preferential treatment. If you don't deserve it, they're giving you preferential treatment. Amen. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So even by verse verse, you can see you can be saved, but you might not be attending a church. But the Bible says you need to be added to the church. You need to be added to a church. And then also, when you're added to a church, and you know that's your church, then it's important not to jump around to other churches. Because what does the Bible say? Those who are planted in the house of God. Those who are planted near streams of living water. What? They are, they are prosperous. They succeed. Because you can't take a plant and be like, okay, I'm planted here at this church. When you uproot the plant and plant it here, when you uproot the plant and plant it there, that plant's going to die. Amen. In order to prosper, you need to be rooted in a church. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. And then Hebrews 10 verse 25 says, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. And the word there, episynagoge, the word, not forsaking the gathering of ourselves together, only appears two times in the New Testament. Amen. Because why are we saying this? Jesus gathers together. Amen. He's gathering together all the men. Amen. You guys listening? And then we have communion together. Hallelujah. So what does he say? Not forsaking the gathering together or as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another. And so much for more as you see the day approaching. And since you guys are special, I'll say this now, but I won't prove it to you. I'll prove it in, on a Wednesday night. This exhorting is also anointing one another. Anointing one another and so much for more as you see the day approaching. So how can you anoint each other if you're by yourself in your house for all time? You need to come to church and you need to get anointed. Amen. The Bible says the elders of the church will anoint you and then you will be saved. You will be healed. And if you did something wrong that week, then you will be forgiven. Amen. So here we see the day approaching. When must you be anointing one another? When must you be gathering together? As you see the day approaching. As we see the day approaching. So we saw Israel become a nation again. Amen. You need to have faith to believe it. No. You saw Israel become a nation. So you saw that. So that's the day approaching. And that refers to the coming of Jesus Christ. And then the Bible says that we're gathering together here on earth in the name of Jesus. So that's the one episynagogue. But there's a second episynagogue. And where's that going to take place? When Jesus gather, gathers us together in heaven with Him. When the rapture takes place. So let's take a look at 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 1. Now brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together, episynagoge, to Him. Hallelujah. So we're gathering together here on earth. Amen. Having fellowship together in a love feast. Then we're going to be gathered together by Yeshua in heaven to have love feasts. Amen. For the big feast, the feast 
the, 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 the supper with the Lamb, the wedding that will take place. Amen. The judgment seat of Christ. Hallelujah. So we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled. So what happened here? Why were the Thessalonians shaken in mind? Because some people came to them and said, the day of the Lord had already happened. Caesar is the Antichrist or whatever. So Paul says, do not be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. So let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Hallelujah. So what were the three questions we wanted to ask ourselves in the beginning? The first one is, why does the church not have to go through the tribulation? Then the second one is, was, how do we know that the day and hour, no one knows the day and the hour, refers to the church? Amen. So, that day and the hour also were used in a Jewish sense. When the Jewish people got married, okay? The father was the only one that knew the day the, the, the son will go and fetch the bride. So then the son would say, I don't know the day and the hour, only my father knows. And also we know that when Jesus instituted the communion, what did he say? He said, I will not drink of this cup again until I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. So that's the engagement we had with Jesus. And then Jesus says, I don't, know, I don't know the day and the hour, only my Father knows. So it's referring to a wedding. Amen. A re wedding with the church. Hallelujah. Okay. Let's continue. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come, unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. If you guys don't understand, I'm going to explain now. Verse 4. Who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you not know that when I was with you, I was still with you, I told you these things? Verse 6. And now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. Verse 7. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who it now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Verse 8. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Verse 9. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. And with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this reason God will send them strong delusion, that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Wow! So let's. So what did we say? We want to talk about the falling of away and the departing that takes place at the same time. So we already saw in 1 Thessalonians 5 where the Bible says that when they say health and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them and they will not escape. But then Paul says we are not overnight. So he already says that there's a differentiation between those who get destroyed and those who get saved. Amen. So let's take a look there again at verse, at verse 3. But let's read it, 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 3 in the Geneva Bible. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a departing first. And that that man of sin be disclosed, even the son of perdition. So, this word, apostasia, can be used as a departure and as a falling away. So like I said, both are relevant. Because there are those that will depart, and there are those that will fall away. 
Amen. So who are those who are going to depart? Us. Where are we departing to? To the wedding. Amen. We are departing to the wedding. Then there are those who fall away. And like John said, those who fall away, those who fall away were never safe to begin with. Amen. They fall away. Hallelujah. And then who, so what must happen first? First the falling away. All the departure must happen. Then the son of perdition will be revealed. Who is the son of perdition? Who is this person? The Antichrist. So the Bible says in verse 6, And now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. So who is the one restraining the Antichrist? The, the Holy Spirit. Maybe I should talk without the microphone. So it's the Holy Spirit. I think it's because I'm sweating too much. <laughs> so it's the Holy Spirit that's restraining him. And how do I know that? So let's take a look at Genesis 6 verse 3. Genesis 6 verse 3 says that God, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit, will not strive with man forever. It will not strive with man forever, but because they are flesh. And the years will only be 120 years. Okay. So it's quite interesting that we're talking about a departure ha happening and then a destruction. Because the Bible says only 400 and... Why did you put that off? It's warm, po. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so it's 120 years, the Bible says in Genesis 6 verse 3. So you can show it there for them, Genesis 6 verse 3. Many what any bombs, okay. Yeah, I think it's fine. If you guys can't hear me, you can move closer. Okay. So Genesis 6 verse 3? Okay. <laughs> so it says, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his day shall be one hundred and twenty years. So here the Bible says that the Holy Spirit, the Spirit will sustain the, uh, restrain the Antichrist, but when he's taken out of the way, and this taken out of the way, if you look at the Greek, it's referring to he moves out of the way. So he allows the lawlessness to come through. So he's been blocking it, and then he moves out of the way. And the lawlessness comes through. But it says here, 120, is your very end? 120 years. Okay, so what does 120 refer to? It refers to a time period that happens where, where God allows stuff to happen, but then after 120, judgment comes. Okay? So the Holy Spirit restrains judgment for 120 years, but then He moves out of the way, and He allows judgment. Okay? So if you look, who lived for 120 years? Moses. Okay? So Moses lived for 120 years, then what happened? He died. And Jonathan took the children of Israel into the land of Canaan. Joshua took, took the children of Israel into the land of Canaan. Amen. So there's the departing, the moving into the promised land. Amen. But if you look at Noah, Noah spent 120 years building the ark. And then judgment came. Okay? But, most, but Noah was saved. He went into the ark. Hallelujah. And then you can take a look at even something like the church, whose number always refers to 120. When you think 120, you can also think of the church. Because how many people were in the upper room when the church was born? 120. Okay? So 120 has got something to do with the church. And then if you look at Samson, when Samson was standing with his hands on the two pillars, okay? And when he broke the two pillars, judgment fell on the Philistines. If you look at that word pillar... Its number is 120. So when the church is removed, judgment falls. Okay? So you've got this. When the departure happens, 
The falling away happens, the Holy Spirit moves out of the way, and judgment falls. Amen. Hallelujah. So, 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 3, Let no one deceive you by any means. So let no one deceive you. Okay? That for that day shall not come, except there come a departing first. So first the rapture happens, the departing first, and that, that man of sin be disclosed, even the son of perdition. But he will only be dis disclosed when the church is removed. Amen. So we're talking about the falling away and the departure. Let's take a look at another uh, scripture that clarifies that. Matthew 24 verse 32. Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. Who's this tree? Who's this branch? It's Israel. Okay, so when Israel is born again, ah, born again, I hope they're born again. When they come back to life, you know that summer is near, that the end is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the doors. Assuredly, I say to you, Amen. I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away to all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. And here the day and hour is mentioned. Verse 36. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. So we know that refers to a wedding. Okay? Because the son, the, the son of the, uh, the bridegroom doesn't know the exact day and hour. His father needs to tell him, go fetch your bride. Amen. So I know also some people take this and say it refers to the Feast of Trumpets. Okay, I don't disagree with that. But I'm not a big fan of that because I feel we need to be ready every day for Jesus coming. Yeah. Then verse 37. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. So what did we say happened in Noah? After 120, after 120 years, the Spirit moves out of the way. Amen? He allows judgment. Then Noah enters the ark. So he departs, but the rest fall away. Amen? Judgment comes. So what happens? For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. Until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. So, how do we know this happens before the tribulation? Because in the tribulation, there's going to be earthquakes, pestilences, all these things. So many people are going to die. If you look at the end of a, of a I mean, even during the tribulation, the people are hiding in caves. They're running away of all these. You can go read Revelation. You'll see how many people die. So yeah, it's giving a scenario of everyday life. Okay? Normal things are happening. You're marrying, you're trading. Stuff is still going okay. Then, until it will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and the other left. So Jesus says that one will be taken and the other left. And if you look at the word taken, it's paralambano, which refers to taking someone, taking someone as a friend, taking someone in marriage. Okay? And if you look at the word for left, it's like divorcing someone. Okay? So some will depart in the rapture. And others will fall away. Why? Because they will never saved. Okay. Verse 42. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Okay, so why do I say that this, no, no one knows the day or the hour, the hour we do not expect refers to the church. Okay, why do I say that? Because 
You don't know the exact day and hour the rapture will take place. But you know the exact day and hour Jesus comes back in the second coming with us. You can know the exact day and hour. But for the rapture, you do not know the day and hour. And what does it say? So what have we been talking about? We're not sons of the night. We're sons of the day. We're not drunk. We're not sleeping. We're awake. And what, we, what are we awake to? What are we, not, what are we sober to? We're sober and awake to righteousness. Okay. So how, do you, how, how, do you, how can you stay awake so that you aren't shocked like a, like a thief breaking into your house? How can you stay awake? Awake to righteousness. Knowing that you are the righteousness of God in Christ. Amen. Why? Because who did Jesus gather together? Who did the are left of gather together? Those who have been declared righteous. Amen. And how are you righteous? Righteous by faith. Righteousness of faith. And like Romans 10 says, righteousness of faith speaks. So you believe it in your heart and you say it. You say, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. Amen. You speak it. And that's how you stay ready. You awake to righteousness and you sin not. Hallelujah. Amen. And Jesus says three times here that no one knows the day or the hour. Okay? No one knows the day or the hour. But here, when you look at the second coming of Jesus, you can count the exact minute, the exact day, the exact hour when He comes back and His feet touches the Mount of Olives. Hallelujah. How long, how long has it been? Maybe I should stop. Okay, you guys tired? Okay, we can stop there for now. Okay. <laughs> so next week Ben, if the Lord allows it, we'll take a look at why you can know the exact day and hour when Jesus returns with us. Amen. Say then that we do communion to fellowship with Jesus. We look to Him. We don't look to our diseases. We don't look to our sins. We look to Him. And most people say, I can't partake of the communion because I have this grudge against this person. Or I, I've got bitterness in my heart. If you're looking at yourself, then you'll never be worthy to partake or do anything. Jesus is the only one who's worthy. It's worthy is the Lamb. Amen. Looking unto the author and finisher of our faith. Jesus is the I left of. Amen. Finisher of our faith. And the faith is that we are the righteousness of God in Christ. And it's a gift. So when you partake of the communion, you know, thank you Lord Jesus that you love me. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that I can partake of the communion because I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. I've been justified. I'm always right with Daddy God because of what Jesus has done for me, because of His blood. And then, what does the Bible say in Psalms 23? He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. So even when your life is bad, there's lots of enemies, you still can gather together and partake of the communion together. And who gives it to you? Who prepares it? Jesus. So you prepare it, you get the bread, you get the wine, but you need to see how He gives it to you. Like Malchisedek. Malchisedek came with the bread and the wine. And He gave it to Abraham. And Abraham responded with the tithe. So Jesus is our Malchisedek. He's our high priest. Amen. Our great high priest. Hallelujah. So let's partake of the communion. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your body. Thank you that we can eat your body in loving, affectionate remembrance of what you did for us on the cross. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that your body was broken, beaten, scourged, that by your stripe we are healed. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your stripe, for your beating. Thank you, Lord, that our youth is renewed like the eagles. Thank you that every time when we eat, we are stronger, healthier. Thank you that our eyes will not dim and our natural force will not be abated. 
We will live to be 120. Thank you, Lord, for your death and that you are coming for us. And as you are, so are we in this world. Amen. And thank you, Lord Jesus, for your cup of the new covenant. Thank you, Lord, for the cup of the new covenant that we are forgiven through your blood. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are our God. That you are our God. You are left off. And that you've forgiven us through your blood. And that because we are forgiven, we can forgive others. And thank you, Lord, that we've been made righteous, justified, just as if we've never sinned through your blood. And thank you, Lord Jesus, that we redeem from the curse, from every curse, through your blood. Thank you for the inheritance of the righteous. That we are blessed, healed, forgiven, and provided for. In Jesus' name, thank you, Lord, for your blood. Amen. Hallelujah. Awesome. Hallelujah. We need to take a look at what I left off. Because when you see Jesus, what happens? You become as He is. Amen. And how is Jesus? He's healthy. How is Jesus? He's friendly. He has the fruit of the Spirit. Amen. When you see Jesus, you rise above your situation. You rise above your circumstances. Like Peter that looked towards Jesus and he rose above his circumstances. Hallelujah. We can look to Jesus and go into His blessing. Hallelujah. Because what happened to Peter was a miracle. I mean, it's a miracle. It goes against the natural laws of physics. But when you enter the blessing of Jesus, the blessing of health, the blessing of provision, the blessing of whatever your hand touches is blessed, amen, will prosper, then you truly are blessed. And you need to know that you are blessed and you need to confess that. Say, I am blessed. So my job that I have, the job that I'm going to do, will be successful because the Lord is with me. Like Joseph. Whatever Joseph did prospered. Amen. And even Potiphar saw that. Potiphar said, this guy is blessed. I mean, like Jacob. Jacob's father Laban, Laban, didn't want him to leave because he was blessed. Because he had the blessing of the Lord that came upon him. And that was, that's why it's so important to bless one another. Like to bless your wife, to bless your husband, to bless your friends. Because words have power. Amen. And if you look at Esau, why did Esau... Why did he throw a tantrum when he didn't get the blessing? Because he knew how powerful the words was. And also, words have so much power that when Isaac said it, when he said, I've given Jacob the blessing, he didn't go, wait, wait, wait. No, that's null and void. Okay, it's too late. Okay, I'll just, ca- oh, it's not too late. I'll just cancel it. Okay, I'll just cancel it. And okay, it's Esau, I'll give it to you. No, he said, I have blessed him and he will be blessed. So the same way, when you bless people, you need to know that as the righteousness of God in Christ, your prayers, your words are powerful. What does James say? James says, the prayers of the righteous avail much. Amen. So the same way when you pray in tongues. When you pray in tongues, the Bible says there at James, the fervent prayer. And the Afrikaans say, the So the fiery, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. So when you pray in tongues, you need to know that the Holy Spirit goes out. He does what he, you prayed for through Him. He performs it. Hallelujah. Amen. And then, when you pray in tongues, what, is that, what are you praying for? You're praying for anything that concerns you. Body, soul, spirit, your family, your friends, your relationships, your business. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Okay, let's receive the blessing. Hallelujah. You can lift your hands and close your eyes. Yivarechecha, ya, v'yishma recha. Ya er, ya, penav, ilecha, v'chuneka. Yisa, ya, penav, ilecha, v'yasem lecha, shalom. Thank you, Abba, that you bless us and keep us. Thank you, Abba, that you make your face shine upon us and you are gracious to us. Thank you, Abba, that you turn your countenance towards us, you lift your countenance upon us and you give us your Shalom. Your Sar Shalom from Yeshua. Hallelujah. B'Shem Yeshua in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Halleluja. Halleluja. Awesome. Awesome, guys.